Police hunting a Northwest District man who is suspected of murdering his brother. Ashni Singh and Winston Brassington return, granted $6 million bail each for misconduct in public office. Ten homeless following Hatfield Street fire. Minister Amjadan confirms that the pirate attacks stemmed from a feud between Guyanese fishermen in Suriname. Those were the top headlines for the week ending May 11. I'm Sandy Ramudar. Good afternoon. Starting things off on MTV News Update's Weekend Review, we tell you that as the Linda Creek Commission of Inquiry continued, the loan commissioner was baffled as to why civilians were not interviewed by the investigators from the joint services. The lead investigator, Major Andy Pompey, did admit that he was not given any specific instructions to only interview members of the joint services. Here's Yanis Abrams. Major Andy Pompey, who led a team with five members of the joint services, was tasked to investigate the allegation laid against the joint services in 2008. The allegation stated they killed the eight miners at Linda Creek in June of that year. Major Pompey was then a captain and was appointed as officer commanding in the military police department. The Guyana Defense Force officer stated during his investigation, two GDF pilots were interviewed along with members of the A and B team who were carrying out joint services operations in the Lindo Creek area at that time. The investigation was completed on June 8 and the report was submitted to the then Chief of Staff Gary Best. From the report, it was found it could have been a possible robbery at the camp in Lindo Creek resulting in the deaths. Some members of the Joint Special Operations Group A team were aware of the Lindo Mining Camp through Mr. Clifton Wong, Clifton Wong, who was one of the miners. However, the Joint Services claimed they never visited the camp physically. H, some members of the Joint Services were familiar with Mr. Clifton Wong. It was established that Mr. Wong was transported by the Joint Special Operations Group A team on the 10th of June from Yunamco checkpoint at Itabu to Kokwani. He rejoined and returned to the checkpoint at Yunamco on the morning of the 11th of June, 2008. He then was taken to a location between the checkpoint and Christmas Falls area. Mr. Wong claimed his camp was located in an area of the trail where he came off. J. The Joint Services were operating on specific instructions to deny the criminal gang from using the main road, the Kokwani Aichuni Trail, between the period of the 8th of June 2008 and the 21st of June 2008. Further, the Major was questioned by Commissioner Retired Justice Donald Trotman whether any civilians were interviewed during that time, which he denied. The former Chief of Staff had instructed the team to investigate the circumstances of the deaths and allegations of the Joint Services involvement. Additionally, Major Pompey said no specific instructions were given to only interview members of the Joint Services. Right. You or your team or any member of it didn't think that at least the man who is the person making the allegations should have been interviewed? Even in hindsight now, what do you think? Sir, the Joint Services at that time were being accused of these killings and the discovery was made on the 24th of June 2008 and I received my directive four days after the 25th of So, So based on that, the Joint Services were being accused and Mr. Rokium also it was, in my opinion, the tense time, sir, and we were instructed 
to conduct interviews and do an investigation with the persons of the teams. And at our investigation, sir, the persons who appeared before the team, meaning those persons came before the team. We, we sat as a team and first the teams came before us. We didn't venture out to interview other personnel and other civilians, inclusive of Mr. Rokio. When the team sat, the operation teams came before us. Further, it was concluded that the allegation made against the Joint Services team was false and several ranks of the GPF and GDF claimed that they alerted the miners of an operation being conducted at Kokwani and Christmas Fall, which they disregarded. Reporting for MTV's News Update, I am Yanis Abrams. Still on the issue of crime, police in the Northwest District are now on the hunt for a man believed to be responsible for the murder of his 23-year-old brother, Clinton Henry. Henry was found dead with a wound to his head in front of his parents' home. Here's more from the Shanagom's Cornelius. According to F Division Commander Kevin Adonis, about midnight on May 5, the suspect and his brother were seen in the village of Yambe imbibing alcohol in front of their parents' home. They were in the company of two other males at that point. Commander Adonis explained, based on information provided to the police by the now-dead man's widow, the two brothers continued drinking alone after the two other males left. It was moments after the men had left that Henry's wife heard a loud commotion and ventured outside only to see her husband lying motionless with a gaping wound to the head. Henry, who worked as a gold miner, was eventually taken to the Port Kaituma Hospital where he was pronounced dead on arrival. Commander Adonis revealed. When she went to this, she saw him lying because the place is dark. She used her cell phone and, and saw him lying, panting for breath. She took him back. She shouted for help. I think two of his cousins or some relatives or neighbors or whatever went and assisted her and take him into the building where he became lifeless then. The no. other brother, mm -hmm. he went down somewhere in the, in the area and met an individual, sorry, an individual home. She observed that he was blood on the abdomen. Yet, uh, his brother stabbed him. With such vital information relayed to them, Commander Donis stressed that the police are actively pursuing the matter with much diligence, as the brother of the deceased, who has since disappeared, is now the prime suspect in the murder. But we you know that we, we've been there, going there, see if we get him. But we're mobilizing and, and, and going in there frequently to make a search to know where if he gone where. But the two of them used to work in his in his head camp and everything. Thing occurred by, by the, the, the parents' residence. The body of Clinton Henry is scheduled to undergo a post mortem examination. Reporting for MTV News Update, Lashana Gomes Cornelius. Ten persons are left homeless after a fire of unknown origin gutted a house and damaged another in Hatfield Street. The fire was first observed in the living room. Here's more from Yanis Abrams. This is what is left of two houses on Hatfield Street. Yesterday, around 17 hours, a fire of unknown origin completely gutted a house at 69 Hatfield Street and damaged another. Ten persons are said to be homeless. According to one occupant of the home that was completely destroyed, Patrick Hall, one of the children living in the house observed the fire after she left two toddlers in the living room and headed to the kitchen. Moments later, arriving back in the hall room, the fire was seen and an alarm was raised. Uh, the, according to the people around here, nobody really didn't went home. Everybody, mostly, everybody's work, everybody. It's just the, the children from school and so the girl coming home from school. Yeah, so she opened the door and when she go in, she go in the kitchen. When she look back, she see in the hall, they got the fire. The man stated his family has nowhere now to call their home. He noted that they slept in a vehicle during the night. Everybody in train got to go to school. They got nothing. Where everybody they here with, this is what we got. We have nothing, no clothes, nothing. This is all we got. 
Yeah, we just there. We, what we got? Most of the savings in the house. Fine, money wise, and you know, everything we use. I had in my uh, suitcase and stuff back up. Then sister, then she had, she stuff back up and everything gone. We, so we just, we got. It's not we got. Uh, she applied for land, and well, we hoping that uh, this trip and she go back. I think they 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 being approved for land for sure. A couple, but the money was too much. We didn't have the money for pay for the land. I hope that we go back this trip here, see if we get it, we can try our best to pay for it, you know, we build something as fast as possible. In a humanitarian effort, the mayor of Georgetown, Patricia Chase Green, rendered some assistance to one of the occupants of the house which was damaged. She informed the media that the owner of the house lives abroad. From this family, I was told three. Right, but they're not willing to talk and give out more information right now. And I can understand the, the, the position they're in. So I've given them some space, I've given them some numbers, and asked them that when everything is settled, they can reach out to us and we'll give whatever assistance that we can. Additionally, Hall mentioned that several ministers and other kind-hearted citizens have contacted him. Reporting for MTV's News Update, I am Yanis Abrams. On a positive note, ExxonMobil has stayed true to its word and is utilizing the services of Guyanese. Guyanese accounts for 26% of the total crew on the company's drill ships. Here's more from Nikhil Jondu. Senior Director of Public and Government Affairs of ExxonMobil Guyana, Kimberly Brissenton, during an exclusive interview says there are approximately 80 Guyanese working on both of the company's drill ships. She noted that Guyanese are also employed on the supply vessels that provide services to the two drill ships. So there are several supply vessels that take materials, food, pipe, mud, back and forth between the shore and the, and the drill ships, which also have Guyanese seamen and mariners on them as well. The ExxonMobil official said that it takes about 150 persons to man one of the drill ships. That would put a total of approximately 300 persons combined on both drill ships. Brissenton said those personnel will be divided to work a 12-hour shift per day. She also said that the drill ship will have to work continuously to explore the Starbuck block for potential oil reservoirs. On average, about 150 people. And remember, it's 24 hours a day. And so the guys and girls work 12-hour shifts, 12 on and 12 off. So you, each position has two people that staff it per day. So about 150 people to keep a ship going. In Article 19 of the 2016 Petroleum Agreement, it states that the contractor, without prejudice, to employ and contractually obligate subcontractors to employ Guyanese citizens, those who are employed, should have the appropriate qualifications and experience to work in the petroleum industry. The article also states that within six days prior to the beginning of each year, the contractor and the subject minister should provide a plan to utilize qualified Guyanese for the upcoming year. Following the submission of such a plan, the minister and the contractor will meet to discuss and consider the effectiveness of such a plan. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. On the political scope, the opposition party is strongly condemning the charges led against Dr. Ashni Singh and Winston Brassington, claiming it was a planned circus display. The party is also conceding that more charges are coming its way with the likelihood of convictions. Let's hear more. The opposition party is dismayed by the occurrences at the Georgian Magistrates' Courts on May 8. Former Finance Minister Dr. Ashni Singh and former head of NISIL, Winston Brassington, were handcuffed and placed on $6 million bail each for three counts of misconduct in public office. It is against this backdrop that opposition leader Bara Chagdio, who labelled the court proceedings as a circus display, is telling citizens not to expect at medium decency from the government. But for us who have been in the political arena, what played out in Parliament yesterday is not shocking, it's not a revelation, it was expected. 
APNU is operating according to plan. Jagdeo says the party is expecting to see more charges and even convictions, all part of the government's plan. The opposition is maintaining that the charges were laid to damage the reputation of the duo. But they had to make it a media circus, and I recognize this because, what is it, reputational damage. While Jagdeo is blaming the government for the occurrence at court, it was a law enforcement agency, the Special Organized Crime Unit, that laid the criminal charges against the two and the justice system taking its course. Sandy Ramudar, Frem TV's News Update. Guyanese authorities have confirmed that the two recent pirate attacks stemmed from an ongoing feud between Guyanese fishermen living in Suriname. Here's more from Nikhil Duondu. Minister of Public Security Kemraj Ramjitan has confirmed that the recent pirate attacks stemmed from an ongoing feud between Guyanese fishermen. He told media operatives this afternoon that someone killed a brother of a businessman which resulted in the death of more than a dozen fishermen. Minister Ramjitan said 30 persons were arrested. However, 12 were detained by the Surinamese authorities. We are hoping that we are going to still have survivors. And uh, because, you know, hope is something that rests eternal in all of us. But whatever we can do to help the relatives and friends at this stage, we promise that we're going to do moral, psychological and financial, and both sides indicated as much. Acting Commissioner of Police David Ramnarine says he has since been in touch with the Surinamese authorities since the incident took place. He too has confirmed that the attack is as a result of retaliation from a drive-by shooting resulting in the death of an individual. Ramnarine also stated that a second pirate attack, which occurred on Wednesday last, is linked to the attack, which has left authorities searching for more than 12 persons. He also noted that three Guyanese have been arrested and are in police custody in Guyana. We did receive some information for one or two fishermen, who see, which seem to have uh, placed one of the persons in custody at a certain area in Suriname prior to the departure of fishermen, and a certain conversation would have unfolded. But that is as far as we have at this point in time, based on the fact that we are in constant contact with our legal advisor, having obtained statements and detailed statements and so on. There's a lot more work that needs to be done to get to the bottom of it. The thing is that uh, the victims, the first four victims who reported, gave call names, call names of the persons who were involved. and. Um, on the Suriname side, as far as I'm aware, one called name by the name of Crackhead and another by the name of Dick are amongst the several persons that they still have in custody. They had 12, and I'm told the last report I got from our contact in Suriname was another three. Another three persons were arrested on Monday afternoon are in custody now in Suriname. The search is still ongoing to locate the remaining 12 fishermen who are believed to be dead or alive in the Atlantic Ocean. The pirate attack took place on April 27, 2018 close to neighboring French Guyana in Surinamese waters. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. The Anti-Piracy Task Force is actively working closely with the Coast Guard and Fisheries Department to bring about requisite safety measures for fishermen and other seagoers. This comes on the heel of the recent deadly piracy attack. The Shangom Screenings has more. According to the head of the fisheries department, Denzel Roberts, it is hoped that with a recent tragedy in Suriname's waters, measures to protect fishermen out at sea will be put in place by both the Surinamese and Guyanese government. Roberts, saddened by the great loss of life of many Guyanese fishermen, related that the tragedy is a major indicator of how dangerous the job can be. Regarding the tragedy of the, uh, the recent tragedy of the fishermen, even though it happened in, in, in the neighboring Suriname, most of, 
the fisher folks are Guyanese and I must express my sympathy to the families and the relatives and close friends of those who suffered. I know it's still they're still looking for some bodies but as we would have read in the newspaper the government is actively working along with the with the authorities in Suriname to ensure that justice may be brought to those who committed the act and measures will be put in place to ensure that the seas are more safe for the fisher folks. Further, Robert stressed that the anti-piracy task force, which falls under the remit of the Ministry of the Presidency, is actively working along with other agencies like the Fisheries Department to revamp the safety procedures and monitoring of vessels. Today, we, um, our, our, we have what you call an anti-piracy committee with the Coast Guard, the police and our fisheries, which one of my staff is actually they're having a special meeting today. So. Um, we are working along and we, it's, it's, it's very difficult because it's a huge area to monitor and um, we don't have the full resources but we will try our best to ensure that the seas are safe, the rel which is the relevant authorities will be looking into that. Late last month, a total of 22 fishermen were brutally attacked by pirates while working in Suriname's waters. According to one of the survivors of that attack, the pirates reportedly robbed, beat, chopped and banged several of the fishermen before throwing them overboard. Guyanese fishermen are no strangers to such piracy attacks. In May of 2017, fisherman Harish Singh, while out in the Atlantic fishing, was attacked by a group of pirates that carted off with more than $1.4 million worth in seine and fish. And in 2012, off the coast of the Pomeroon River, 15 fishing boats with a combined crew of 19 were severely beaten, robbed, banged and left adrift after the pirates seized their engine. After that attack was carried out, then head of the Presidential Secretariat, Dr. Roger Luncheon, had stressed on the significance of having appropriate marine communication. He had urged that there be more substantive inputs from law enforcement officers to help provide a system of helpful support to fishermen out at sea. Reporting for MTV News Update, Lashona Gomes, Cornelius. One minute of silence was observed in solidarity with the bereaved family members who lost their loved ones in the recent part attack on the high seas. Let's hear more from Nikhil Chondu. Prime Minister Moses Nagamotu says as the country celebrates Social Cohesion Day, the country is also mourning the loss of several lives. He noted that the recent pirate attack has left numerous families in a state of loss and without hope. Prime Minister Nagamoto told the audience that he came from the background of a fishing family and that those individuals are still conducting the trade. The Prime Minister admitted that fishermen face dangers out in the high seas by the ocean current and weather patterns. As they risk their lives and always place their loved ones in anxiety and uncertainty. But to share the sea with murderous men is at the root of the tragedy that has claimed so many lives. The Prime Minister has acknowledged that there has been a breakdown in social relations among sections of the fishermen. He noted that a series of criminal acts have triggered a deadly vendetta. That would have far-reaching effects on social cohesion in Suriname and in Guyana as the pain, loss and grief of survivors and bereaved relatives are multiplied. In a situation such as this, our notion of sharing the faith of our brothers and sisters require that we give solidarity to the victims. Let their loved ones know that they are not alone. So I ask that we all stand and bow our heads in dignified respect in memory of the murdered fishermen. Surinamese authorities are still looking for 12 fishermen. The men were attacked on April 27, 2018 in Suriname's waters closer to French Guyana. Thus far, three bodies have been recovered, 
while five persons have survived the ordeal. Nikhil Chondo reporting for MTV News Update. Taking a look at the infrastructure sector, a senior engineer has come out and made it clear that contractors are not mostly to be blamed for the deterioration of roads. He revealed that those overladen heavy-duty trucks contribute to most of the damages. Here is more. Complaints about deteriorating roads have over time been made by citizens. Persons have often blamed the work and the materials used by the contractors. However, senior engineer attached to the Ministry of Public Infrastructure, Sherrod Parkinson, says a number of factors are responsible for the road's corrosion. Parkinson cited the frequent use of roads by overloaded heavy-duty vehicles as one of the major factors responsible for the weakening of the roads. Parkinson said roads are constructed to bear a certain weight capacity and any overweight can pose a threat to the roads. I guess parallel to or probably even more important than that is usage. All right? We have a situation where for a number of years we've been trying to bring the weight control of trucks um, to the front where we actually manage, monitor, control the, the, the volume and the size of trucks traveling on the road. That plays the most important part in what happens to a road. You can design a road and ensure that all the construction goes according to plan and everything is done perfectly. Then you put a truck that got an axle that is 15 tons overweight traveling on the road, it defeats the entire purpose. He noted that the issue is a major concern of the Ministry of Public Infrastructure as weight limits should be adhered to by drivers. The senior engineer contended that the Public Works Group has always executed favorable designs and construction for road projects. A third National Social Cohesion Day was hosted on May 9 at the National Cultural Center. After this event, the government recommitted to fostering unity whilst condemning polarizing politics. Here's more from Nikhil Jondu. Prime Minister Moses Nagamoto says Ghana has always been a diverse country. The Prime Minister was at the time speaking at the third annual observance of National Social Cohesion Day. The day is being hosted under the theme celebrating lasting relationships in a diverse society. Nagamoto says on the eve of the 2015 general and regional elections, the electorates chose for themselves to end the one-party rule government since independence. This, he noted, has given the leaders of the nation the chance to show better leadership and to be more inclusive and tolerant of the values and differences between and among religious and ethnic groups. We are all here today as Guyanese nationals with a unique and distinct personality and identity even as we recognize our cultural mix, our traditions and our customs. Minister of Social Cohesion Dr. George Norton says the ministry has been on several outreaches throughout the country. He noted that at those outreaches, his team met with the communities to bring about some level of cohesion among the people. Dr. Norton also noted that the focus of fostering social cohesion is part of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Ghana is on the precipice of newness, new wealth, new ways in which the rest of the world perceive us, particularly so in the Caribbean. I don't think in the National Airport of Barbados there's any longer the Guyanese bench, for those who might be aware of what it signified at one time. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. The $78 million kitty roundabout will be opened in two weeks. It is also touted to reduce traffic congestion around the area. Here's more. With the implementation of the Kitty Roundabout, traffic congestion on that major intersection will be avoided. So says Senior Engineer of the Ministry of Public Infrastructure, Sherrod Parkinson. Um, you're looking at 50 seconds at, for one particular vehicle. One vehicle. When you add that 50 seconds up over 
25, 30 cars coming from the East Coast. You end up with a delay that passes the Guyal gas station heading east on Kitty Public Road. You add that up over the period of the, 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 the rush hour, which is roughly around 7.15 to about 8.30, 9 in the morning. You're looking at delays of half an hour for some people, delays of 45 minutes until you depend on what time you actually come down. All right? You add that up over uh, two, pay, two, two times per day. Add that up over five days a week, Monday to Friday. Add it up over a month. You're talking about monies we can't even calculate in savings and gas, savings and run time for vehicle maintenance costs and all these things that you really can't put a definite figure to, but it's way up. Over a period of time, the $78 million expended to complete the roundabout will be negligible. While 95% of the work on the roundabout is already completed, the installation of signs and road markings are in progress. The markings will be placed on the road and on poles, giving motorists instructions on the direction they must go. The looping junction is expected to open in about two weeks. According to him, there will be an assessment of vehicular usage, with police being present in the peak hours. If necessary, traffic lights will be installed at the J.B. Singh and Visinjan roads to allow for the better flow of traffic. In addition to this, there has been no decision by the Ministry regarding plans for the middle of the roundabout. Vehicles are expected to traverse 30 km per hour when manoeuvring around the roundabout. There will be two zebra lanes to accommodate pedestrians. That's a wrap for MTV News Updates Weekend Review. The newscast can be viewed online on our MTV's Facebook page and also on our YouTube channel. Join us on Monday, May 14 at 7 hours 30 for an edition of MTV News Update. On behalf of our news team, I'm Sandy Ramutar, thanking you for watching.